This episode of the Word and Youth Ministry podcast is brought to you in part by Crossway, publisher of the ESV Student Study Bible. From the Center for Parent Youth Understanding and the CPYU Podcast Network, you're listening to the Word and Youth Ministry, a podcast by youth workers for youth workers, where we give insights, strategies, and helps for effectively teaching God's Word to our students. We are on episode 10 of the Word in Youth Ministry podcast. My name is Kyle. I'm the pastor of student ministry at Old North Church in Canfield, Ohio. And I'm here as always with my friends, Matt and Linda. And we are excited that we are in episode 10. Uh, we have talked about many different topics around the word being in youth ministry. We strategically name the podcast, the word in youth ministry, how we can use the Bible as we minister to students. And today we want to talk about a very important topic and entitled Misused Bible Verses in Youth Ministry. Misused Bible Verses in Youth Ministry. And really what we're trying to think about, and we're going to talk about it in, in a few minutes here, is how to use the Bible in context. So as this episode is going to drop most likely sometime this fall, uh, there's pretty good odds that your youth ministry, if you're listening to it um, shortly after it drops, uh, your youth ministry is starting, uh, fall programming is in full tilt, and you are thinking through how can we best teach the Bible to students. So before we talk about a few examples of Bible verses that uh, are misused, that are taught out of context, uh, first we thought it'd be good to just talk about general hermeneutic principles in youth ministry. Now you might be listening thinking, uh, what does the word hermeneutics even mean? Uh, so Matt, why don't you tell us what the word hermeneutics means and then just get this conversation started off for us? Yeah, her hermeneutics is just the um, the discipline of interpretation or the science of interpretation. And the, the basic idea when we think about um, hermeneutics and the Bible is that, like you said, we want to read things in context. Now, when it comes to the, the Christian scriptures, there's a, another layer on that context, and that is that the thing that we're reading in context context somehow points to Jesus. So let me give you an example. In um, Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, he says, he quotes from Hosea, and he says, out of Egypt I've called my son. And he's saying, you see, this is how we know that Jesus came from Egypt back to, uh, back to Israel. And it's, it's really interesting the way he quotes that, because in Hosea, Hosea is talking about the original context. He's talking about God bringing his people from Egypt out, uh, out of Egypt into the promised land in the Exodus story. But it's important to see that for the apostles, the resurrection of Jesus is so monumental to them that they have to see scripture as a contextually talking about the original audience, but then going to and through Jesus um, and so one of the things that we always need to think about is how is this in context for us to its original audience and then pointing us to Jesus before we then apply it to ourselves. And Matt, before we uh, uh, talk with Linda a little bit more about the context piece of this, as we think about teaching this to students, I think that uh, many students know that obviously Christianity is about Jesus, right? It's in the term Christianity, Christ, uh, but as we're teaching it to students, I think we need to, as we talked about on a previous episode, continually remind our students that the whole Bible is pointing to Christ. Um, if you're new to the podcast, we talked about this uh, previously in episode six, teaching Christ in all of scriptures. But as we just uh, dove in here, as Matt just explained, uh, we need to remember that we need to know the original context and point to Christ, because obviously uh, Christ is the, is the point of the whole Bible. Um, Linda, take us a little deeper here as we think about context. Yeah, so there's a lot of Bible verses that are well known um, that we sometimes don't actually remember what context they um, are set in, right? And that really matters because we understand that principle in just normal life. If you quote something that somebody else said, um, it's often pretty easy to make it sound like they were saying something that they totally didn't mean. If you use just part of what they said in an interview, for instance, 
a media clip, right? But when you hear the whole um, context of what they said, often it means something very different. It's easy for us to do the same thing with Bible passages, right? So we need to um, understand the passage in its context before we just hear one little snippet and rush to the kind of the first interpretation that we really like. Um, so I can, for example, think of times when reading um, through the Bible myself, I understood passages in a new way just because um, I was reading a book through, right? So you ever just have like a Bible reading plan that takes you through the Old Testament? I remember once I was doing that and it was taking me through um, like just the life of David. And all of a sudden, like things are um, really awesome. And you're like, man, this King David, like he's the stuff. And then all of a sudden you're like, whoa, 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 David, what are you doing? Like it was going so well. And it just like kind of slaps you across the face when all of a sudden everything happens with Bathsheba and Uriah. And you realize like how devastating that must have been. When I read that kind of in its context for the first time, and I didn't quite realize what, where I was and didn't know to anticipate that was like the next thing I was going to read, man, it, it really changed the way that I saw that passage. Right. And there are so many things like that, that if, if we just took the moment to to read the passage in its context, um, it helps us understand so much more. You know, we can see in that Old Testament passage, man, David is not the great hope for Israel. There is somebody else, um, ultimately Christ, right, that is going to be that great hope. David cannot be that, right? And so that's kind of what we're talking about when we talk about um, these passages we're going to touch on today that we have to understand them in their context so that we don't miss a lot of the meaning. And the, if without knowing the context and without um, reading it, it can it can land us in a very opposite uh, location of where the text is actually taking us. I think the last point of um, hermeneutics or um, understanding as we're reading the Bible that I just want to point out for youth workers would be to help our students uh, actually read the text. Right. So many of our students have preconceived notions, as you were just saying, Linda, um, but might even overlook short and little words in the text that might turn the whole meaning upside down. I mean, one example in my own life um, outside of the Bible that just happened to me today and yesterday is uh, yesterday I uh, I turned our air conditioning unit off in my house and uh, put a new filter in, which I don't do as often as I should. And I noticed that uh, last night it was so hot in my house. And this morning I asked my wife, do you think it's hot in here? She's like, yeah. Well, she sent me a text message today saying, I turned the heat on instead of the air conditioning uh, when, I re when I turned the system back on. And then you know why? Because I, I do this often enough that I was just hitting buttons and I didn't actually look to see what the word meant, right? It said heat instead of cooling. And I think that just like tying this to the word, you know, I can tell sometimes when students are asked to read the Bible out loud, they'll read it in a way where they're just like used to hearing something and they miss what the word of God actually says. And so I think like if we could just sum this all up hermeneutics is reading the Bible in the original context and what it actually says. And as we're going to see here in these few examples that we're going to talk through, um, sometimes it's one or two words um, that uh, we take out of context or we take um, and we just miss, and that can just lead us to a very wrong um, ending point. So Matt, why don't you start us out? Uh, misused Bible verses in youth ministry. What's one example that you'd like to talk about uh, on today's podcast? Yeah, I was thinking about Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. And that's, it's such a beautiful verse. It's written all over the place, right? We put it on the back of our letter jackets. Um, and I think we tend to want to use this verse to say, like, even though I might be in a tough spot right now, or in an aimless position, God is going to help me out. And uh, th that's not entirely untrue, certainly not entirely untrue. Um, but there are some key, there's some mis things that are missing there. So first, so we, let's think about context. Okay, so the, the Israelites or many of the leading uh, families of the Israelites are in Babylon right now. They've just lost their temple. They've just kind of lost their land. They've lost their king. And they've been taken by Nebuchadnezzar in 586 BC um, to this faraway place in Babylon. And there have been some prophets, some false prophets who have been saying, hey, look, y'all are only gonna be here for a couple of years. So don't like barely unpack. 
Like you're going home soon. And so a lot of, you know, so, so these people are kind of like, oh, okay. Like this is just a kind of a short stopgap. And Jeremiah keeps saying, no, no, you're going to be here for a while. And then that's into, it's into that context that he speaks these verses. And there's a couple of things that we just want to pull out here. One is starting in verse five in chapter 29, build houses and live in them. God says, plant gardens and eat their produce, take wives and daughters, take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage. And then uh, going down to verse seven, but seek the welfare of the city where I've sent you into exile. So a couple of things that stand out to us there is God is saying, Hey, look, it's not, <laughs> it's not that you just so happen to find yourself in a bad spot. It's that God himself has sent you into a bad spot. Like, and when he says, I know the plans that I have for you, plans to help you flourish, he's not just saying like, hey, I know the plans that I have. I'm going to get you out of here real quick. He's saying, hey, I actually have a purpose for sending you into a really bad place. And that purpose is actually for you to bring, bring peace and prosperity to this bad place. And so, and ironically, when we read those verses, I know the plans I have for you, we read them like, oh, okay, like, okay, where, where are you going to get me to next? And what God is saying is like, actually, I have a really, really good thing for you to do here where you are in this hard spot. And of course, this, this brings us to Jesus. I mean, Jesus is the person who left his father's side and went into exile, so to speak, on this earth to bless a people that didn't deserve it. Um, and so that through now then through Jesus, that Jesus kind of centered thinking, oh, I realize I'm an exile, an alien, a stranger, a sojourner in a place that doesn't always love me so that I can bring God's blessings to that place. Um, so that's a different way. I think that's a different way of reading that passage. Yeah. And that's, yeah. Uh, that's probably one of the most quoted Bible uh, passages at graduation time, right? Where like graduation cards that, uh, you know, say happy graduation, they open up for, I know the plans I have for you. Uh, and that just gives a lot of context to what this is actually saying. Uh, Linda, why don't you take us even, even deeper into this idea? That, that's exactly what I was thinking about as he was talking, how often this verse is used to say, hey, God has great plans for where you're going in life. And that means that you are going to be so fulfilled and you're going to be successful. And you know, they might not say that explicitly, but that tends to be how we hear it when this verse is used in that way. And if you just look at it in its immediate context, like Matt pointed out, um, it's, it's in this part of Jeremiah that the false prophets are saying, Hey, just, just a few years before you go back, um, from exile. And Jeremiah is saying, no, that's not quite it. Like in verse 10, right before this, it says when 70 years are completed, mm. I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place for, I know the plans I have for you. Right. So the Lord is saying like, Hey, my plans are not to do exactly what you're hoping for and wanting. It's not what you um, have in mind, but instead my plans for you, they do involve 70 years of you not being in a place you wanna be. But you know why those plans are the plans I have for you? Because I want you to have a hope and a future and to flourish. Because in this place, I will help you um, to, to do all of that, you know? And so God can, um, have plans for us to go through hardship, to bring us to, to know him and to be like him and to flourish in his ways. Um, and so that's one of the things I like to point out with this verse is that it doesn't just mean that God is going to give me a successful life as I might have it pictured in my head as a, an American, right? But it might mean God has some difficult things planned for my life, but he has those things planned um, for a purpose. And that purpose um, is ultimately for my good and for um, hope in my life. Yeah. That, thanks for, uh, you dovetailed on that so well, Linda. Thank you for that, that reading of verse 10. And this is a little bit of cheating here because it's using a, uh, the Hebrew, but when he gets to that verse 11, so in Hebrew, the verb 
itself has the subject in it. So you could just say, I know the plans and just with one word, I know. But in this verse, it it duplicates, um, Jeremiah duplicates the I. So I, like I myself know. And so mm-hmm. what's what's happening here in the Hebrew is, is he's saying, it's not that you know the plans. It's not about your plans. It's I know the plans. He's actually almost setting it up in opposition. Um, and of course, you know, like, and again, like Linda pointed out uh, so well is that, yeah, like God does have plans to prosper us in the long term. Like he is going to bring us back mm-hmm. from these hard places. Um, it's just not going to happen on my timeline or, you know, according to my plans, but his. And this can be such uh, countercultural, not only to Christianity, but just our culture as a whole, right? That we are trusting someone else and trusting someone else's plans uh, to help us. Uh, the only thing I wanted to add to this discussion is we're really thankful for one of our podcast sponsors, Crossway. Um, in their ESV student study Bible, which is something we give to our students if they don't have a Bible um, in the Bible that I'm currently using as I teach them, is in their study uh, notes under this passage for 2911, um, it just has a really clear description I wanted to read. It says, God's plans for the exile aisles are for welfare. See note on verse seven, not evil or calamity. Having sought Babylon's welfare, the exiles will receive God's welfare in the form of a future and a hope in their homeland. And one thing I wanted to note, even as I was talking earlier about just noticing small things, is if a student has a study Bible like this in their hand, and it says, see note for verse seven, um, we just see a connection here, a hermeneutical principle, right, repetition in the text, where we see that they're supposed to, as Matt was mentioning earlier, seek the welfare of the city. And now what's God saying? He says he has plans for their welfare. And so as we're just using different study Bibles um, and study Bible um, tactics here um, with our students is we can just put a resource like this in front of them to help them understand this is not just a Hallmark card. This is not just a saying that uh, maybe a grandparent uh, when they want um, their grandchild who might be in our youth ministry and might be struggling to know God has plans that are good. Um, but this is something that we can actually hold on to. Um, and we can, um, we can teach students that even though our life might not be going the way they want it to go, that God's plans are still good and he is still faithful um, above all things. So we're going to take a quick break here and then we're going to jump into two or three more uh, different Bible verses that can be misused, but how we can teach them in context to our students. This episode of the Word in Youth Ministry is brought to you in part by Crossway, publisher of the ESV Student Study Bible. This Bible is ideally suited for students who are serious about God's Word, who want to learn more about what the Bible teaches and how the Bible applies to all of life. With 12,000 clear, concise study notes, the ESV Student Study Bible includes numerous other features, such as nearly 900 Did You Know Facts, 120 Bible Character Profiles, 10 Topical Articles, more than 80 maps and illustrations, and more. These and many other features make it the most comprehensive and content-rich study Bible available today. To learn more, visit crossway.org slash youth ministry. We're back here on the Word and Youth Ministry, and we're going to dive into our next misused Bible verse. So I want us to take a look at Romans 8.28. That beloved verse, um, which reads, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Now, when you stop right there, there's probably a lot of different ways that you might understand that verse, right? And I've definitely heard it used, um, probably in some ways a little bit similar to the verse we just talked about in Jeremiah 29, um, that, you know, that means that God is going to take um, bad things in my life and use them to give me more of the things that I want, right? So for instance, if if my house burned down, well, then that probably means God's going to use that to get me a better house. Um, or if, 
you know, a student breaks up with their significant other. Well, that's because God has someone better for them just a few months down the road, right? That that's a lot of the way that this verse tends to get used. Um, because when we end there, um, we're very likely to come up with our own definition of what is good, right? And I've even heard this uh, verse preached on once before, and I heard the preacher say, you know, I, I can't tell you what, what it looks like, what that's going to look like, the good in your life. I can't really define that for you. And I remember kind of sitting back there and going, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure that he should be saying that because I think if you keep reading it does actually define for us what our good is, right? And so you keep reading um, in the next few verses, and it says, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the, the firstborn among many brothers. Um, and those whom he predestined, he also called. Those whom he called, he also justified. Those whom he justified, he also glorified. So when you take it all together, what you're seeing is, we know that God works all things together for good. How do we know that? Because we know that he's going to conform us to the image of his son. And because we know that ultimately glorification is coming too, right? And so what is our good? Our good is that we would be conformed to Christ and that that will happen increasingly now in our lifetimes, but also ultimately we will be um, completely sanctified and glorified uh, and conformed to Christ in the future um, in the new heavens and new earth, right? So it's not that my good is about me getting um, that better boyfriend down the line or the better house or whatever. It's, um, it's about God using those things in my life to conform me more to Christ. So a little bit like the Jeremiah passage where it might mean, hey, not that God brought suffering into my life um, to give me something better, uh, in, in kind of the way I might define better, but he's going to use suffering in my life to make me more like Jesus. And that is ultimately what's good for me. What a beautiful exchange, right? That oftentimes we think, uh, that what you were just saying that because I'm going through this, then I'll get that, or because this is happening to me, then something better, but ultimately like there's nothing better in our world than being conformed to Christ. Mm -hmm. And I think this does very well what we were talking about earlier about taking verses in context, because if we don't use the hermeneutical principle of reading the Bible in context, we miss everything you just said, Linda. And I, I don't know about you guys, but like, that's what I want my students, like most of all, I want them to be conformed to Christ. And we realize that looks differently for a middle schooler to a high schooler to an adult, uh, but ultimately, if we can teach them the Bible in a way where they can understand this, right, that all things really do work out for their good, and we might not know this until heaven, um, there's nothing more that we would want them, uh, want them to know. Um, I'm going to uh, just piggyback off of that, uh, similar to how Paul wrote that uh, to the church in Rome. I want to use one uh, that Paul wrote to the church in Philippi, uh, Philippians 4.13, which is a verse that's pretty popular. I know even um, there's a popular NBA player that he has shoes. Uh, I think it's Under Armour, Steph Curry. I think it's Under Armour who makes the shoes. And there's a 413 on the shoe uh, to kind of show like Philippians 413. Uh, and that's uh, Paul writes, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And right, oftentimes we can take a verse like this and we can read it at face value. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So I can I can make the three point shot. I can get the A on a test. I can get the relationship that I want because it's Christ who gives me strength. Um, however, what we often do, again, we miss the context right before that. He says, I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. And then that builds the foundation for what he's saying. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And I think like all three of these go together, right? What Matt said earlier, that God has plans that are good. What Linda just said, that what I'm going through right now, God will turn to good, not necessarily the circumstance, but ultimately what like myself. And then here he's saying, what Paul's saying here is no matter what I'm going through, it's not that I'm going to be able to make it on my own strength but God will be enough for me. 
right? And I think all three of these point to a bigger cultural issue going on is that oftentimes we can become envious of what other people have or envious of other people's situations, but ultimately God's more concerned about my heart. And so when we think about the students we have in our youth ministry, um, I think it's so important for us to look below the surface and to look at their heart. And how does Jesus say we can understand what happens in people's hearts? He says, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So as we listen to our students talking and we listen to what they're saying, it gives us almost an x-ray image into their heart um, to know, are they relying on God for their strength? Are they actually believing that God works all things for their good? Um, I just think it's so helpful in these passages to, to think through, um, are they applied well in our students, but also are we teaching them well? Um, Matt, as you've been teaching passages like this to students or just the Bible in general, are there any other um, principles or maybe experiences that you have that might be helpful for our listeners today? Yeah, I, I, I just really like how you connected this to our cultural moment as well. I mean, in America, we, we definitely think through the lens of prosperity. So, so all of what we are thinking is like, how do I get ahead? How do I do well? How do I um, thrive and succeed? And so that's just colored the way like we we're we're products of our cultural and national, you know, like location. And so that is just going to color the way that we read the Bible. So yeah, we're going to define good in some sort of monetary blessing, probably. Um, and, and it's not that America is kind of like, a, you know, America or the West is particularly like that only like a lot of places to find good that way. Um, but I think the Bible is is written, particularly with a cross shaped um, kind of like a, 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 it's formed in a cross shaped way. It's written in a cross shaped way so that we always want to think about, oh, God is bringing me into the death and resurrection of Jesus. Like I, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. I've crucified myself to the world that I might know Christ, right? Or these things are dead or crucified uh, to me. So that all of the way that we should understand like <laughs> how we read the Bible is all, God is always bringing us downward to the cross so that he can bring us up in the resurrection. And so it's, yeah, it's funny that these verses are all, misunderstandings of a context of suffering and difficulty um, that God is going to bring us through and out of in Christ. Yeah, and I think about uh, right now as we're recording this episode, there's people around the world that are going through horrific sufferings. And I was thinking earlier today, uh, as I was thinking about this, um, how our students interpret the Bible, you know, kind of what Linda said earlier, even some of the things that are really painful for our students and that are real, Right. I don't think we should diminish things. Right. For a high school student who's in a relationship um, and that relationship ends like that's real pain or for students whose families um, might be broken like that's real pain. However, I think one thing we can do just to help our students understand what God words, what God's word means for them is for them to remember there's Christians on the other side of the world right now who are being displaced from their homes and they might never see them again. Or there's teenagers who aren't in a, in a high school in America or a middle school in America who are somewhere in the world right now. And if they were openly talk about Jesus, like it might not end very well for them. And so it's just teaching the Bible in a way where the context isn't only the context of the Bible, but to, I think um, I haven't really thought about it in this way before. So, but I'm just going to say it anyways, um, just the context of humanity right? That we're not just looking at it, Matt, like you said, um, putting on glasses and reading it as an American, but we're putting on the glasses of a human. And we're realizing that there's more out there um, than what we see and what we know. Um, Linda, how about you? I mean, uh, I think you did a, a great job talking through Romans 8.28 and what it means, but are there any other principles or experiences that you have that might be helpful for our, our listeners today? I'm going to go a little bit deeper on our uh, Philippians passage. So, you know, one of the things I've noticed is that um, in some Christian circles, I would say there starts to be this feeling of, oh, I, I should be able to face anything in life and do it with like a smile on my face because Jesus, right. And, um, and I think that this passage helps us kind of, uh, bump up against that and say, Oh, not, not, not quite. Um, Paul himself says, um, that in any and every circumstance, he had to learn the secret 
of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need, right? So I find it comforting that the Bible is not telling me in all these circumstances that suffering is good and I should just bear it with a smile on my face. That's not what we're saying in any of these. Um, but what can happen in suffering is that we draw near to Christ and we learn how to um, walk through that circumstance with Christ, right? And so it's not that if I've spent my whole life um, being rich, that I know how to be poor um, and, and be content in Jesus, right? I have to be poor to learn how to be content in Jesus and poverty. Does that make sense? Like you, it's in, in that circumstance that you learn the secret of facing whatever temptation comes with that circumstance with Jesus. Um, I find it a comfort to know Paul says he had to learn that. Um, and it took me a while in my Christian life, I think, to learn that I shouldn't call suffering good. Um, but it's what God does with the suffering in my life um, that is good. So I think that's something else that that we have to be careful about when we're teaching on these kind of things. And that just made me think, Linda, just the importance um of like you were saying about putting ourselves in understanding, like uh, we have to be careful, but experientially like that God teaches us in our experiences, but also we need to remember that Paul is writing out of his experience too. Mm -hmm. And this is where um, to tie into something that Matt said in the first half of this episode is almost when we're reading the Bible, it's almost like we could draw circles and we start at a small circle, like a verse for, in, for instance, Philippians 4.13. And then we draw a little bit of a bigger circle and we look like, like maybe at that chapter. So not just the verse, but in my Bible I have open right now. Well, I see in that chapter, I see it's in uh, Philippians 4, 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. So now we're remembering we need to rejoice at all times, not just be content, but rejoice. And then maybe it'd be like drawing a little bit of a bigger circle. And we think of the book as a whole. And if we look at the very beginning of Philippians, um, he starts out in verse uh, two by saying grace to you and peace from God, our father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And so now as this circle gets bigger, now we're realizing it's not only about contentment and it's not only about rejoicing, but now the whole like foundation of the book of Philippians is built on the grace and the peace that's brought to us by Jesus Christ. And so just I think this episode has been hopefully helpful for our listeners, but it has encouraged my heart as I teach the Bible to my students um, to remember that not only do we need to teach in the context of what the Bible is, but also the context of humanity and the context of our students who are growing up in a culture very different than the, than the culture that many of our youth workers who are teaching the Bible to their students are growing up in. So I just, uh, I hope that this is an encouragement to our listeners today. Um, I also just lastly want to remind uh, our listeners that for Matt, Linda, and I, each of us are teaching the Bible to students. We are discipling students. We're raising up leaders by God's grace. Uh, so we'd love to hear your feedback um, on topics that maybe uh, you'd want to be discussed in the future um, or any questions and feedback that you have. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, if you email us at the word in YM at cpyu.org, the word in YM at cpyu.org. Here we are, episode number 10. Uh, we made it through 10 episodes and we're excited to continue by God's grace. Uh, remember to rate, like, share, and subscribe on whatever podcast platform you happen to be listening to today. And thanks so much for listening. We'll talk to you next time. Thanks for listening to The Word in Youth Ministry. To learn more about CPYU and the resources mentioned on today's podcast, visit us online at cpyu.org.